everybody to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Matt. Uh, I'm from Houston, Mississippi, and I live in Cashtown, Pennsylvania. Me and three cats. Two on the porch, one in the house, one of which I own. <laughs> one of which I brought from the, the other one outside I brought from the Eisenhower farm because I just didn't want to, couldn't let the old gal go. And my, my kids, sent me a picture of some other cat that apparently came up this afternoon or this morning on my porch and so I may have something else to feed when I get to the house but I told the kids I just want y'all to know I told the kids to get the food off the porch <laughs> <sighs> I can't feed the whole world you know I, I, it, this this thing's not starving so I'm not sweating so we're here for Farnsworth's charge which is one of the mo more what would you say? Uh, understudied? Is that the word for it? Uh, actions in the entire Battle of Gettysburg. It is overshadowed, ladies and gentlemen, by Pickett's charge. And well, it should be. I mean, with the numbers produced and the and the and the uh, potential outcomes for everything, I mean, it just kind of gets swept under the rug. I can remember when I was a small child. I forget what age, but elementary school, probably about the same for y'all. The um, my mother went out and bought those reprints of Battles and Leaders of the Civil War, the four volumes. Mm -hmm. And I remember in volume three that there is an account that I read in elementary school. You remember when, when you were reading it, they had the regular font, but the, but the secondary articles, they've reduced it down to like point six <laughs> or something, you know. You could never read that today, or at least I couldn't. And, uh, I remember reading that in elementary school and trying to trace the route of Farnsworth's attack on that map, you know what I'm talking about, on that woodcut engraving uh, that was located right there. And so, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say I was fascinated with it or anything, but, you know, they say in life you should try to make uh, lemonade out of lemons. And so I was talking to my boss, Chris, this past winter at some point and I said well you know since South Confederate is closed I mean you're never going to have a better opportunity to do Farnsworth's charge because we're not going to have any traffic so to speak and so you know um, it, it's now or never uh, for that so uh, probably once Little Round Top is open next year and I do not have any inside information so I don't have to sneak up can you really tell me when Little Round Top is opening I don't know I'll try to find out uh, but when it is open next year, uh, I don't know if I try this again. So here's the basic situation. I'm going to talk about something that's unrelated but related to Farnsworth's charge. This is you got to understand, of course, the big picture and what's happening on this battlefield at the time. On July 3rd of 1863, on this today, on this anniversary, 160 years ago, at 1:07 p.m two signal guns are going to fire from the peach orchard, which is right there, uh, probably around the Sherpy farm. When those two signal guns go off, that initiates a bombardment that's going to go on for, you know, depending on who you read, once again, probably around an hour. And then there's going to be a delay of a few minutes before the Confederate infantry is going to come marching forward. But anyway, that's not the point of today. If you were standing here on July 3rd of 1863, if you look off in the distance at that, you, of course you see that wood line to your right, but if you look to the left and you look at that most distant wood line straight ahead to the right of the Rose Farmhouse down there, that's Cemetery Hill and Ziegler's Grove back in that area. If you were a Confederate soldier that day, you could have seen here the climax of Pickett's Charge. You would not have known, or at least E.M. Law, the Confederate general, said they knew nothing about the attack until it actually happened. So they weren't briefed on it down here at the end of the line. But nevertheless, with the repulse of Pickett's charge, is what's going to set up Farnsworth's uh, attack on July 3rd. So we had to fast forward the clock a little bit. Let's say, and these are not precise times, so don't write me any letters. I'm just sitting here uh, guessing times. Uh, if the bombardment started at 107, let's say that the Confederate infantry moved forward around, you know, 230, 245. The action which I'm, I'm about to describe, uh, well, Pickett's Charge will be over by, completely over by 330 at the most. 
you know, something like that. That is about the time that the Union Cavalry is going to show up, or I should say, not show up, but start to put pressure on this Confederate line, which is on this end over here. Now, we'll get into that. I'll tell you what their perceptions are and everything. But, or what I think their perceptions are. But the situation for that moment is this. The Confederates on this end of the line, as you well know if you watch the movie, do not hold Little Round Top. Okay? They don't, they don't hold Little Round Top. They don't hold Big Round Top. The Confederate line is along the base, our base of Big Round Top, along Devil's Den, which you can't see right through here, but I'll circle back around. You'll see it's behind that big, I guess that's an oak tree over there down there by the Bushman farm, but it's back behind there. And the Confederate line goes over here, if you follow my finger, to behind that, that wood line, which is the wheat field. All right, that's the front line. But over here, and this is going to be the focus of what we're doing today, is a completely different action. You've got the Union Army obviously occupying the summit of Big Round Top and the summit of Little Round Top and, uh, and on down through Cemetery Ridge. The Union Army has another uh, front to it. It's the front at right angles. So you have the front line right here and you have the flank which is right over here. And these two parts, if you're going to understand, which I don't know if I understand it all myself, uh, we'll do the best. These two parts are not communicating to each other. That's the whole story of about what, what you're going to hear over the next two hours. These Union cavalrymen pushing down the highway that you came down to this program headed toward Gettysburg do not know what the Union infantry is doing right over here. But that's the situation. Now while we're standing here, I would ask you to, to, to put, when I get you down in the valley, you're just not going to get this view. That's why I'm trying to set it up. I may be doing it a little backwards, getting the action ahead of the of the uh, timeline. But when I get you down over there by Bushman's Hill, which we're going to walk down South Confederate Avenue all the way around to the base of Big Round Top, once you get you down to that area, you can't see anymore because you'll be in the middle of the woods, basically. You'll be on the tour road, but you can't see. So what I'm telling you right now is you may have your best view shed of this entire battlefield from a bird's eye view. And what you have right here is obviously the Bushman Farm. And on the afternoon of July 3rd of 1863, we'll start talking about the Confederates. 196 Texans. That's quite precise for July 3rd. We're very lucky to have that number because, you know, the casualty rates are hard to, to uh, figure for, the, for one day. But 196 Texans from the 1st Texas Infantry are going to start to deploy at right angles. In other words, me facing the camera right now. And they're going to string themselves out in a skirmish line, which I'll point out to you once we get over the lip of the hill right through here. In this area, back behind you, where the present-day South End Battlefield is, portions of Eisenhower, present-day Eisenhower Farm, this is where you see Anderson's Georgia Brigade coming up slowly. I'll get back to them in a minute. But they're slowly going to start to deploy along through here. But initially, the only thing standing between two brigades of Union cavalry coming up this highway or across the countryside is basically 200 miscellaneous, thrown together, can't find their command, Confederate soldiers and two cannons guarding this entire flank. Hart's battery, H-A-R-T, is with them. Hart's section is with them that day. And so it becomes a race against time once the Confederates find out that the Union is in force, the cavalry is over here, to protect in this flank right through here. And that's where Farnsworth is going to tie in with the Confederates. My point being, at the very initial, at very initial uh, stages of this talk, is the Confederate line on the right flank, not the front line, but at right angles right here, that line is very thin. It is not held with any type of, of numbers. And so Anderson's brigade is going to be sent up here piecemeal, one at a time, until they bolster the line, but that will be back behind you. In other words, the Confederate line going back to the first Texas down here is very thin. Commander M. Law is now 
help commanding the division because John Bell Hood has been wounded. So you get it for a bus, the little round top commander of the Alabamians is now in charge of the whole division on July 3rd. What well, actually was on July 3rd. But now he's really in charge. He had a couple hours to get his feet underneath. So when they start pushing them back, Law is standing right here. He dispatches the 7th and 8th Georgia, followed shortly by the 11th and the 59th. Mayor's men are advancing on foot, which is probably a very lucky break for the Confederates. Since Mayor's regulars are pushing in a circle, I want you to picture that Union cavalry coming across this field as Law saw it. His perceptions of what were happening out here on this field. And remember, once again, he is the division commander. So he's just not, you know, another another general. Okay. Yeah. Let me get value to the microphone. Uh, start here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I had just returned to the position occupied by our by our artillery, which was in the angle formed by the main and flanking line. When Farnsworth Cavalry Brigade charged the line held by the 1st Texas Regiment. It was impossible to use our artillery to any advantage owing to the close quarters of the attacking cavalry with our own men. The leading squadron forced the federal right wing, overlapped the 1st Texas on its left, and striking the skirmish line only, rode through it into the open valley in rear of our main line on the spurs of round top. When I first became satisfied through information from the Texas skirmishers that Farnsworth Brigade was massing in their front, the 9th Georgia Regiment was ordered from Kern's house to the support of the battery. The former position being now safe, as the other four regiments of Anderson's Brigade were concentrated near that point. Hearing the firing and knowing it because the 9th Georgia came up at a run, just as the 1st Vermont Cavalry rode through our skirmish line, led by General Farnsworth in person. Instead of moving directly upon our battery, the cavalry directed its course up the valley toward Gettysburg, passing between the position of our artillery and our main line. Okay, stuff call. Bottom line is, this is my interpretation, which is open to change. <laughs> Now, Kilpatrick ordered the 1st West Virginia and the 1st Vermont to charge, as I said. And here they come. The Texans have barely deployed when the West Virginians came dashing down out of that, out of that where you see those, uh, those uh, right angle of wood run together in that corner right there. And so when they come dashing out of there, you can see that the Texans, well, look at the distance. Look at the distance from the Texans all the way out to where these uh, West Virginians are coming from. And so, um, quote, the ground trembled as they came, wrote a Texan. They, they downed our skirmishers and charged at us, and in a few seconds were on us. Our boys arose and pitched into them, and they went right rough, right, right rough past us, cutting left and right. Thomas L. McCarty of First Texas. Within 50 to 60 yards of the stone wall, which is right here to your left, the Texans fired, emptying saddles and checking the momentum. Unable to reload, the Texans fought with club muskets, bayonets, and in one case, at least a rock was used to knock a Union cavalryman off his horse as they came by. Well, don't pity pat it now. Let me hit you in the head with the rock. <laughs> See how you feel about it. Let me make it about 10 pounds. Ow! Okay, so some of the West Virginians getting a little ahead of the action rode among Riley's battery and were knocked down by the number one man with his sponge rammer. Knocked him off his horse. Now the broken remnants had to get out. So if you want to picture it, the first West Virginia, the way I picture it, this is what they don't write. And I don't have a percentage. But there's going to be a good portion of the West Virginia boys. Where's Cameron? Because I want him to give my absolution before I start blessing on West Virginia over here. Oh, yeah. A lot of the West Virginians, I think, are going to turn back. 
Why is that? Because they're no different than anybody else. They're charging in column, people. They're not charging in a battle line. They're charging in column, which means they're four breast as they come out of here, which means the head of the column is going to hit the front of the Confederate line a long time before the rear of 390 Union troopers are going to get here. And so I think by the time the rear gets up here, they can see the predicament that the front is in. So what would you do? So I don't know how many West Virginians cracked the Texan line. I can tell you that it's more than a handful. But All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're now standing at the uh, William Wells Monument, which is located on South Confederate Avenue. And once again, I'm going to re reiterate, if you go home and try to follow my tour with your history books, it's probably not going to quite dovetail out. Some of it will, some of it won't. But once again, I, I'm trying to make sense out of something that obviously happened but doesn't make any sense to me right here. So what I'm about to get into, there was, there was three things I wanted to cover today, main themes that I wanted to cover on the walk today. Uh, one is what they were trying to do. Why was, why was Kilpatrick and Farnsworth even charging in the first place? The second one, is the exchange between Farnsworth and Kilpatrick, which I'm about to read to you. And the third one is the death of Farnsworth, which attracts a lot of attention. We'll be getting to that uh, at the next stop. So we're going to go to the second main theme of today. So depending on who you read, either the first Vermont made two attacks or they made one attack. So trying to reconcile this in my head, I was thinking to myself, boy, you know, if uh, the 1st Vermont made an attack, they sure did reform pretty fast and, and, and hit them again. So it's hard to get a unit ready to attack twice. Once they've done it, you know, they're out of energy, the, the, you know, the fear is, it's just hard. And, and you know, your, your command inevitably scatters whatever you're commanding. I mean, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of chaos involved. So to me, it doesn't make sense to me that the 1st Vermont charged more than once. Now that's my take on it, but that, that's, I'm comfortable, that's what I'm comfortable saying right here. Uh, so therefore, why is that important? Because this, this argument that I'm about to read to you, which there's two versions of, and possibly more than that, but I took two of the best versions I could find of it. Obviously, there was some kind of heated discussion between Farnsworth and Kilpatrick. There was a discussion. Now, what exactly was said is up to, up to memory right now. But there was, I believe, a heated argument. Although one Union veteran said none of it ever happened. It was very cordial between the two men. But enough people reported on this that I have to give it some credence uh, right now. So why, therefore, the question came to me sitting in my office, listening to Hank Wheeler. <laughs> The question came to me, why would Kilpatrick be angry with Farnsworth? What would be the nucleus of Farnsworth getting a chewing out by Kilpatrick? And so with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the only conclusion I could come to is, and, you, and you, you'll hear the same thing that I read in just a second, the only conclusion that I could come to was that Farnsworth had not performed like he should have. All right, and for some reason, even though Farnsworth is the brigade commander, he is still near his old unit, the 1st Vermont. In a nutshell, I think that the 1st West Virginia went forward and the 1st Vermont failed to charge at the same time. So what I'm about to read to you, this is my interpretation, as far as like July 3rd of 2023, Matt thinks that this argument happens while the 1st West Virginia is charging out in that field. That's the only way I could kind of make sense out of it. So, don't you get too far. Kilpatrick watched the West Virginia charge somewhere near Bushman's Hill. And according to Captain William C. Potter, he turned to Farnsworth and asked if he could take Riley's CSA battery atop the hill where we started. Farnsworth said he couldn't make it because of the high stone wall surrounding the position. Kilpatrick persisted in his argument. 
especially after the charge started to fail. And Farnsworth stood firm, arguing that charging the revs, quote, was worse than folly and certain destruction. I'm used to stuff writer who takes everything that I don't think about it anymore, you know. So that's right. So we're now standing in the D-shaped field. And if you look at this, if you look around you, here is the, I don't know what you call it, the straight line of the D. And here is the oval. See the D? All the way around you, the D-shaped field. Kind of cool, isn't it? Now, I told you at the last stop that I can't tell you with 100% certainty who went where. All right? In one account, I believe it's Captain Parsons, he has the uh, Wells Battalion galloping up. And one of the cool things about the D-shaped field is that stone wall right there. But you can barely see, if you keep looking at the edge of the woods, at the edge of this field, you can see the stones right through there. That is where the Confederates are going to come from behind. When Ben read to you the account by E.M. Law that he saw the 4th Alabama, the raggedy Confederate flag, come out of the woods, that happened over there in that corner of the field. They could see a lot further back in 1863. But the 4th Alabama will come from this way, the 15th Alabama will come from this way, and they're going to try to close it off. Now, what I can't reconcile in my mind is, and this depends on who you're reading, is does Wells ride through this field, Wells and Farnsworth, do they ride through this field once, or do they ride through the field twice? Now, that depends on all who you're reading. Um, I hate to misquote, but if you look on the Civil War Trust map, they have them coming out and advancing straight and then coming back through the field one time back through here. Uh, what would that be? Clockwise, if you will. On the other hand, Captain Parsons has them coming up, and on the other side of the stone wall right there, he has that battalion galloping down by uh, column and fours, and coming through the field and out the other side, out into that valley. To orient you people, Devil's Den is out in the direction over here. All right? And so if this was open, you could be like Rock Benning, that quote that I read you uh, before. Anyway, um, here they come. Exit this way. And pretty much all the Union troopers are going to be exiting the same way that they came in, because that's the only way they know to get back to where they came from. So it makes sense to me that they'd be coming through here twice. Now, other accounts have Parsons' command charging down through here and skirting this edge of the field and down into the valley. I think Parsons went basically straight from the Wells Monument somewhere in there and dashed out into the valley. Okay, so Farnsworth and his men, regardless, the Union cavalrymen, beyond a doubt, blast their way through the Confederate line facing this way, punch a hole in the line, and they ride out into the valley. But have you ever, like, um, have you ever gotten a hold of something and then realized at that exact moment that you had bit off more than you could do? <laughs> Whether it be a home repair or this guy one night in Tupelo. <laughs> Yeah, just, you know, where's the door? I think that's exactly what happens to the Union Cavalry. They get down here on the floor of this valley, and they don't know what to do. They're here, they've broken through, but there's no plan. And the organization, the unit composition, has fallen apart. So what do you do? They, they mingle, they basically, the way it sounds like, like a mixing bowl, all those different units, or I should say battalions, 1st West Virginia, 1st Vermont, those men, miscellaneous men, are mingling down here by the Slider Farm and out here behind Devil's Den. We have accounts of Georgians shooting at them from Devil's Den. So I know that they had to come close enough behind Devil's Den to, for them to shoot at them. So anyway, to get to the conclusion, um, 4th Alabama, once they come through here, the 4th Alabama starts running down through here. As Law said, they're running. There's no battle line. And I can't, they either were shooting at them when they went through the first time, I believe so, but they weren't ready, meaning they weren't set up. But the second time they came back, 
It's pure dances with wolves. They're ready this time. And so those 4th Alabama is positioned along that stone wall and thundering up here, put it in your ears, thundering up that trail right here is going to be the Union Cavalry. Can you imagine standing here? Uh, Oates is going to advance. He's going to be positioned like this. He's going to reverse his command and come in like this. He will have skirmishers out front of him, just like battle formation. So the Alabamians that the, that the Union soldiers talk about meeting in this field are probably from the 15th Alabama, from that skirmish line. So, Quote, I was ordered to face about to resist cavalry. We marched rapidly up to the rear over the rocks, and the Vermonters were upon us before we could form. They were within a few paces when we gave the order to fire. The first ragged volley missed, reportedly hitting only one horse, but the second firing was more effective. A horse fell, quote, shot in the breast only a few paces from our lines, and the trooper came down with her standing erect on his feet a stride of her. Instead of surrendering, he quickly threw up his carbine, this happened right here, and discharged it directly in our faces, but no harm was done. Then throwing down the gun, he jumped over his horse and he ran. A puff of dust flew out of his blouse, which never covered a braver heart. As the bullet penetrated between the shoulders, and he fell, meeting the same fate as his horse. So in conclusion, <laughs> Barnesworth either dies. Barnesworth either goes down right here in a nutshell. They either go down right here, where obviously you've read this monument so far, or it may have been another Union writer named Captain Cushman who was wearing a gold, excuse me, a white fringe jacket with gold trim that had been made to him by the hands of a lady which she said no bullet could penetrate. <laughs> Barnesworth, before, excuse me, before Cushman charged, he put a silk handkerchief over his head to keep the sun off, and that is who Law says, describes that he saw dashing through the field. So the debate, in conclusion, is, was it Barnesworth that was up here and was and shot himself? Or was it anybody? Or was it Captain Cushman who was mistaken for Farnsworth and brought? In conclusion, Farnsworth's uh, star from his jacket, which was actually Alfred Pleasanton's old uniform, was cut off the insignia, was cut off and given to Law, or excuse me, to Colonel Oates. And that was in the Alabama governor's office in the post-war years, Farnsworth's star. So I think, beyond a doubt, Farnsworth dies in this field. Whether he shot himself is up to interpretation. Thank you for watching our video. Please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, please leave those in the comment section. We'll work on getting them out to you as soon as possible.